of the National Trust Foundation. We're delighted to be here with two titans of business. This conversation fits perfectly with our focus on entrepreneurship this week. Yesterday we heard from experts talking about demographics of China, healthcare, economics, infrastructure. For the rest of this week, we'll hear from businessmen and entrepreneurs. Today we hear from Hua Chang Hua, President of Boston, and Mark Breyer, Vice Chairman of Prudential. So if this was a dating service, a match between a startup and a 140-year-old business seems unlikely. What did each of you see in this partnership before you sealed the deal? Did you go first? Okay, I'll start. Um, when we met Fosun Group, we didn't have an insurance business in China. We did have a mutual fund business, and that was a partnership with Everbright Bank, which is a large state-owned bank. And one reason that we didn't have an insurance business is that we were moving deliberately, learning from what was happening in the market. There were a lot of joint ventures between foreign insurance companies and various kinds of domestic Chinese companies. And there was a lot to be learned from just watching how this unfolded and what worked and what didn't and how the partnerships evolved. And we actually met Fosun without specifically thinking that there was an insurance joint venture or even a bigger business relationship coming. Um, the first contact that we had with Fosun was through an email from a Fosun employee who was also a graduate of the University of Rochester where I went to graduate school. And it was basically a cold call. He said, the president of Fosun Group, Mr. Liang, whom you met yesterday, is visiting New York. This was in 2008, I think is visiting New York, and he wants to talk to American executives about what's going on. This was the beginning of the financial crisis. So he wanted to talk about what was happening in the US economy. So he and I met for breakfast, and the chemistry was very good. We had a stimulating and interesting conversation, and we didn't really talk at all about folks on prudential relationships. But he was coming back again in six months or so and, and asked to have another meeting. So we had another meeting. And once again, the chemistry was good. It was interesting and stimulating. And they started thinking and we started thinking maybe we should talk about more, and in particular, an insurance venture. And so now we start to get into a little more of the punchline. Um, we had been talking to other potential partners in China. And frankly, we were frustrated. We weren't really finding a good fit. We weren't finding the right philosophy. We weren't finding the right approach to the business. And we weren't finding the right approach to the partnership. But as we talked to Fosun, and then ultimately had a meeting with Chairman Guo, we were on very much the same frequency about the commercial orientation and the mindset of working as partners. So the, the thing that really, from the Prudential side, and I think probably also from the Fosun side, brought us together was, let me, let me tell you a short story that'll kind of frame this. Sitting down with most potential partners in China, the first topic of discussion was dispute resolution. Sitting down with Chairman Guo, the first topic was, what business can we do? How can we make this work? Where's the commercial opportunity? What does Prudential bring? What does Fosun bring? And how can we make that work together? And then we'll worry about partnership details and framing out the formality. And that was such a breath of fresh air. That was the connection that, <coughs> excuse me, that really made the difference for us. That the fact that the focus was on the commercial opportunity and, and a real partnership instead of dispute resolution and one from column A and one from column B for the partners as you go through how to run the business. So we, we made that connection. As we got to know each other, I, I think we found a lot of common values, high professional standards, um, high standards of business conduct, high standards of personal conduct, uh, aspirations for a successful business. So everything kind of clicked, but it was really clicking much more around values and intangibles and chemistry as much as around selling insurance. 
Yeah, first of all, thanks uh, for coming and uh, welcome everyone to here. Uh, my English is not so good, so I'm sorry if you use the translation. So, now, uh, uh, just like Mark said, there is a spark between him and Leon. They both like each other. Xin Jun came back and told me there was such a company called Prudential. To be honest, I was quite hesitant from my perspective back then, but as you know, almost none of the Sinu Foreign Cooperative Insurance Companies in China were doing good, especially those in the form of 50-50 cooperation. I was quite concerned. So we were hesitant about this kind of cooperation. But as Mark said, as we got to know more about each other, it is not about cooperation between China and U.S., but between two enterprises. And it's not only cooperation between two companies, but between two teams. It's people to people. Whether the culture, views, and the way of doing things of the two teams are in common is more important than anything else. After we met, the more important thing is to agree on strategies, to have common cultures, and to have trust in people. This is very important. Actually, we have many problems in our cooperation and different opinions on our team, our strategy, and how to build a business model. We have different ideas. But with the foundation of trust between people, we can communicate. There are different views, but we can keep communicating. This is particularly vital. We heard a lot yesterday from speakers who described mistakes that China made in recent years, from the lack of controls on air and water pollution to the one-child policy. One speaker bluntly said, China has heavily mortgaged its future. Does this affect your business decision making? Maybe you should go first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to judge whether any decision is right or wrong. Sometimes, because you make a mistake, your next generation needs to make some sacrifices to correct that mistake. We have been trying to make many decisions in the past 60 years since the country was founded. Some decisions are clearly wrong. They are simply destructive like cultural revolution. Some other decisions have difficulties. They are imperfect, but they are beneficial at a specific time. So I don't think we can simply say they are wrong, including one-child policy and problems that pollution has caused. Instead of judging if we were right or wrong about those things, now we should think about how we could solve the downsides of those decisions. This should be the way we look at things and solve problems. We made those decisions. There are good sides and bad sides. They're both fair. Rather than arguing, you are wrong about this and that, and you should be responsible for them, it's more important to find solutions to those downsides. For example, it's time to make some other minor adjustments to the one-child policy, so we are actually doing this. Indeed, pollution is a problem that we have to face now. But fast growth in the last 30 years did cause a lot of problems. Now we are facing them and trying to solve them. These are problems, but also opportunities. For our cooperation, they are more like opportunities. This means more opportunities for Fosun as an investment company. Yeah, let me talk about some elements of the business context of that issue. Prudential is a company that's very proud of what it does with respect to corporate social responsibility and our reputation. 
A phrase that I use often is a sense of a higher purpose, that, that we're about more than just EPS and selling insurance. And we're in a spotlight. We're a major global brand. Our, our reputation matters a lot. The value of that brand is enormously important to us. And so we're careful where and how we use it and with whom we associate. And as we think about entering China and you know coming into an environment where there are issues like the ones that you just talked about, uh, one of the things when I talked about common values that we share with Fo Sun is this sense of a higher purpose. Mr. Guo wants to leave China better off when he's finished with Fo Sun than it was when he started with Fo Sun. So they've been among the first to establish corporate philanthropic initiatives and a foundation and programs of corporate giving. They've been among the first to uh, address issues related to things like the, the environment and pollution from the private sector standpoint. So there's a context here for us where you know coming into a market where those kind of things are true ha does have an influence on the decisions that we make, the way we think about entering the market, the way we think about our brand in that market, and the way we think about the, the company that we've associated with in that market. And you know, again, to use the phrase, the, the sense of a higher purpose and the focus on the, the value of our reputations and the, the sense that Fosun has of giving back and doing the right thing and, and having an impact are all things that are important to us and part of that fit in values and, and the way we think about things that, that allow us to operate together the way we do. Um, we'd like to open this up to the 10 journalists that came to um, uh, Shanghai with us. So, Mark, uh, can you can you go back to what you said at the beginning of your discussion? Uh, that's right. Excuse me. We need the microphone. Oh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Ah, ah, guys ah. in the booth need to hear. Yeah. Can you go back to the, uh, the, uh, the beginning of your discussion when you when you mentioned that you were looking to make inroads uh, in China? Uh, can you can you explain a little bit about that? I mean, obviously, the, the growth of China is, is a is a uh, an attraction for any company that's looking to expand globally. But what else is it about China, uh, the Chinese economy, uh, and, and the maybe demographic changes, uh, uh, financial changes, economic changes, that made it, it made perhaps imperative for Prudential to, to expand that in, in the way that you have? Well, I, imperative may be a good choice of words. Because if, if we're looking around the world at opportunities to grow and opportunities to use the skills that we have in running insurance businesses in particular, then China is at 40,000 feet, a great opportunity and, in quotes, an imperative. But as we looked at the market, we also, you know, as, as you dig deeper, the underpenetration of the sale of insurance would imply that there's a, a, an opportunity that's out of proportion to just the scale of the country. The fact that most competition was kind of plain vanilla in the sense that it was higher agents and see what they can do, and we thought we could do better than that. We have a great track record in international insurance. We're the third largest life insurance company in Japan by sales, and that is a shrinking market where we out-execute the enemy. And as a result of that, we gain market share and we grow rapidly. So we thought the combination of the scale of the market, the, the under-penetration of insurance products, and the nature of competition made this a good place for us to be. We needed the right partner to come in and execute, because in China we have to have a joint venture partner. We can't have a wholly owned subsidiary. But the attraction of the market was based on those kind of characteristics. To be honest, Prudential didn't enter China early. It is indeed an urgent matter. It should enter China as soon as possible. It is not early. But relative to the future, it's not too late, too, because China is still having high growth. To use one term, insurance penetration, the proportion of insurance strategy to GDP is not high, so the future room for growth is still large. Now the policies are not supporting insurance by, for example, using insurance for taxation deferral, but in the future, there will be such policies. 
So China's insurance sector will have another wave of rapid growth. This is the first point. The second, like Mark said, we need to have Chinese characteristics based on our experiences in the U.S. Besides, we need to find some new growth methods with the backdrop of the internet, especially the mobile internet. So we will have bigger room for growth. In these aspects, both of us completely agree with each other. So it's not copying experiences from the U.S. or Japan. It's more about combining with China's conditions on the basis of experiences, and then creating more good business models. Questions for the chairman.、Uh, you obviously created a very successful、uh, privately owned company. I'm curious: are you, is, do you consider Fusan more the exception to the rule? That is, can entrepreneurs today, in today's climate, create a company that will grow to the size of Fusan and just、uh, be just as successful? So, can you give me your take on what are is it conducive to start a company, a privately owned entrepreneurial-driven company? In China, that can grow to your type of levels. We are a very small company. You should know that. The real big company went to the U.S. not long ago. It's called Alibaba. It's lucky that we've made some investment in it too. Prudential. And us invested fifty million dollars three years ago. It's tenfold according to today's market value. So there already are real big, privately run private companies in China. Just to give you some examples, like Alibaba, Tencent, Lenovo, and Huawei, they're all much bigger than us. So in China, establishing a private company and growing it to a big one based on the market is not something rare or impossible. Fosun is actually one of those companies. It's not rare. I am ashamed that we are doing poorly and we need to work harder to catch up with them. Uh, Mr. Greer,、uh, could you talk about more generally the challenges and some of the successes we've seen with other American businesses or Western businesses in China in Shanghai? And, and I'm from Detroit, so I'm obviously thinking of the auto industry. But yeah, yeah any any of you want to make a comment? On that? Well, let me start with insurance. As Mr. Guo said in his comments. There were a lot of joint ventures between foreign companies and Chinese companies that weren't working very well, and there were big challenges around alignment of expectations. There were big challenges around communication. One thing about the insurance business is that it starts off slow, and it has an appetite for cash when it's starting. And you know, there there have been times in the not so distant Chinese past when the horizon was pretty short. And the desire in the market for a quick payoff was on everyone's mind, and so having patience to build an insurance company, reconciling the expectations that it's going to take time, it's going to take capital, and we've got to build it, was something that was not always sort of right in front of everybody. And by the way, that's been right in front of us from the beginning. We're very careful about making sure that whether we like it or not, we both know what to expect. So. I can't point to this as a long way of saying I can't point to any joint <coughs> ventures in insurance that I would describe as having been extremely successful in China. And a lot of it reflects the dynamics of partnerships and just some of the frustrations around the foreign partners and the local Chinese partners. I don't know enough about other sectors or other industries to answer that question. Mr. Guo may have some views on other partnerships outside of insurance that have worked. Do you have advice for other American companies though that are trying to break in? 
whatever. Do you have advice for other American CEOs trying to break in to this market? Well, the choice of partner is number one, number two, and number three. I think you know, making the right decision about the partner and the partnership it is the only way to ultimately succeed. And in our case, as I said, there were a lot of positive intangibles around values, around approach to business, around standards of conduct and expectations. So I think the, the starting point, and we were very, very deliberate about our approach to choosing a partner, and Fosun Group was very deliberate about their approach to choosing a partner. And I think the, that would be the advice, to just don't rush, take your time, and wind up with the right people across the table. Foreign companies come to China to invest. Actually, Fosun also goes abroad to invest. When we went abroad to invest, I told my team not to complain. No matter what problems we encounter, don't complain. Because when you go to a new place, you must adapt to the new environment, get familiar with it, and contribute to the local community. Not to ask the local communities to change in order to meet your demands. I joked with Japanese companies, you Japanese companies go to the U.S. to invest. You say you're not capable when you fail. Then you come to China to invest, then you say China's business climate is bad when you fail. So I agree with Mark that you must understand the local business environment, find a good partner, and make a business decision that suits you. So don't complain, and work constructively. Hi, I have a question for uh, Mr. Guo. Uh, you've made investments in the United States in a variety of cities. I'm interested in what, what factors do you weigh before making a decision in the United States? Uh, the second part is, does geography matter? Um, and thirdly, I'm from Chicago. I wonder if you've looked at any deals in Chicago. No matter if it's going to the U.S. or other countries to make investments, it's a business consideration to us. There are no other purposes. We want to have business success. But to achieve this, you must respect local legal, environment, and local communities. Just like us, you need to understand the local conditions. For Fosun, Another important aspect is whether this investment could be connected to China's momentum, as we are rooted in China, which means connecting China's momentum and the investment company. This is a very important factor that we consider. So in the U.S., we invested in St. John. This is a very expandable brand, which has a huge growth potential in China in the future. We have three pharmaceutical R&D centers in Silicon Valley. The U.S. is very strong in the high-end research and development, but all of our three centers can be connected to the Chinese R&D system. So not only they can make full use of the low-cost R&D force on the end side in China, but also the high-end pharmaceutical R&D strength in the U.S. These two can be perfectly combined. Of course, we will also make some pure commercial investments. For example, we invested in Chase Manhattan. We inspected the whole of New York City for this building. We inspected the real estate in New York City and watched it for four years, but we didn't make an investment. My wife asked me to buy an apartment, and I didn't. After four years of inspecting and watching, it only took us a month to make a decision and buy this building because we already knew this market so well. I'm very satisfied with the overall investment climate in the U.S. There is nothing we could complain about. It's a very level playing field. It's a very mature market. What we need is to do our best.
，所以要的是我们自己把它做好。Uh, just perhaps following up on that, uh, I'm curious what the hurdles are for you doing business in the United States. We hear a lot about regulatory hurdles that make it difficult for companies to do business in the United States. Uh, and I wonder if you could list some of the challenges you've faced or things that the United States could do better, perhaps, to encourage more investment by foreign companies in the United States. <laughs> To be honest, I didn't see any hurdles. No matter if it's investing in St. John, purchasing Chase Manhattan, or establishing three R&D centers in Silicon Valley, we never had any hurdles. So I don't think it's a problem. I think what the U.S. needs to do is not to differentiate whether this company is from China or from another country. We need equality. As an investor, we also should not expect special treatment because we are from China. China is already the second largest economy in the world. Many investments are going to the U.S. and many investments are going to China. This is normal. It would be abnormal if there were no such investments. So it's very natural for increasingly more Chinese companies to go to the U.S. to invest. It should not be an exception. The U.S. government does not need to make some special decisions to welcome Chinese investment, but it should also not discriminate against Chinese companies as well. That would be enough, especially towards Chinese private companies and also state-owned companies that are running based on market rules. Do not discriminate against them. Part of what we're trying to do in the Chinese market is focus on what we call protection life, the, the products that actually provide significant material life insurance benefits, and, and corollary products maybe in things like health care or retirement. And I'm saying it that way because your point about risk, not just on the part of companies, but also on the part of consumers matters. <clears throat> there have been times when the market has been dominated by sort of short-term investment-oriented type products with a lot more bells and whistles around the investment pieces and not such an emphasis on the quality of protection. And when I talked about our legacy in international insurance and the things that we've done in Japan, what, what we've built there is a business that is the best in the world at selling protection life. And so our emphasis in the business is to try to shift people away from thinking about investment attributes and financial risk into thinking about financial security and protection. And, but it's, it's a battle in the marketplace because the legacy is very much around a shorter term focus, more risk and more investment attributes. Insurance products are not my strength. What we need is, we require our team to design products that our Chinese clients would like more. Second is to make products more internetized, fulfilling the preferences of post-80s and post-90s. I like some insurance products. Some of the insurance products now in China even become more entertainized and fragmented. For example, travel insurance will be categorized into airplanes, cruises, and buses, and use the internet to sell. It's fulfilling the preferences of the younger generation. We will try our best to encourage our team to innovate, but this is not my expertise. Thank you. 
团队去创新，但肯定不，这不是我的专业所在。How will the G Obama agreement to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 mm -hmm. percent affect your um, industrial businesses? Do you have an obligation to help meet this goal? I think the gas emission goals are not, in any country, need to consider the reactions and pressures from its neighbors when setting a development goal. This is necessary. To be motivated to do it, it's definitely not because of the pressures from the neighbors, but the needs of its own growth. China is going to cut gas emissions and face environmental problems. On the one hand, there are pressures from other countries. I believe there are. But more importantly, from the consideration of our own development, we need to do this until a point. As you can see, much of our water is polluted and there is smog in Beijing. Shanghai is not that bad. Have you been to Beijing? Did you come from Beijing? The air is good these days. There is a term called APEC blue. It is unusual. But now we rather slow down our growth to protect our environment. From this perspective, there will be an impact on us. For example, we have steel sector development. We need to spend more to transform our manufacturing sector and steel sector. We need to invest more in protecting the environment. This means our profits will be lower. But I think this is a cost you have to pay. On the other hand, this is also an opportunity for us because this will create many more new sectors, including water processing, air processing, energy saving, new energy, etc. There will be more opportunities. So for Fosun as an investment company, we need to pay more costs on the one hand, but we also see more opportunities on the other hand. We will work based on this mindset and direction. I don't have any you your thoughts on that? <laughs> no, I, we don't have any industrial businesses in China. <laughs> <laughs> um, do either of you have uh, remarks that you'd like to make to the group of journalists who are here? Yes, give it a We have one more question. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Um, I'm, I'm from Detroit, <clears throat> which is uh, considered a distressed city or a rust belt city, and there are many others in the American Midwest and elsewhere in, in the United States. I'm very interested in the role of Chinese investment dollars in buying distressed real estate. I'm wondering if Kosan has done that or considered it, and if you feel like there are some good, good bargains out there, whether it's um, industrial space that can be repurposed, we're just simply speculative real estate. Uh, and I say this because uh, some Chinese uh, investments have come into Detroit and they bought skyscrapers uh, that they plan to develop. And um, if you could talk about Bosan and maybe other broader questions. Uh, in terms of choosing cities, Fosun is more inclined to New York City, Paris, big cities, including Tokyo. In terms of choosing real estate, we have two preferences. One is big buildings that have stable contracts and rent income. This is consistent with Fosun's insurance capital. For one, Fosun's strategy is a complex financial service with insurance at its core. For the other, it includes global investment rooted in China that has industry depth. We hope to invest part of our insurance money into real estate that could generate steady returns. The other direction is the development projects that could benefit from Chinese wealthy people's demands to purchase properties. We are also interested in these projects. For example, in New York City, 
I think more and more Chinese wealthy people would come here to buy an apartment or a school district house for their children's education. These are the directions that we are more interested in, including Sydney and Paris. We will focus more on the investments that have the purpose of meeting Chinese people's demands to purchase housing and diversify their asset allocation. So the cities you mentioned, and also other cities, the two cities in the U.S. that I visited the most are L.A. and New York City. I rarely visited other cities. I have a question for each of you and to you, Chairman. Um, what do you think that China can do to, uh, to better attract foreign investors in the country? Um, I'm curious if there's any regulations or any changes in law that can be made that can make it easier for American businesses to operate in China. And for you, Mark, I'm wondering, is it required by law to find a joint venture partner when you enter the country? But if you could rewind the clock and Hindsight, would you have sought uh, a, a Chinese partner anyway, or would, do you think you would have gone in and um, on your own? You want to go first? Yeah. Okay. What China can do to attract foreign investment? Yeah, what changes that? For a long period of time in the past, China used preferential tax policy to attract foreign investment. In fact, this is very unfair. Local companies pay a 33% tax. To attract foreign investment, we offered tax exemption or 15% tax. I think this era should have passed. In the future, what we really need is to provide the same national treatment to both domestic companies and foreign companies, allowing them to compete equally. What Chinese governments need to do is also to build a level playing field. As you all see, we are building free trade zone. We have signed a trade treaty with South Korea. We are going to sign a free trade treaty with Australia very soon. What we need to do more is to build a lawful and legal environment that is based on international rules and equality. There is still a lot of work to be done in these areas. After joining WTO, after joining WTO, we have revised many laws according to the WTO rules. The beneficiaries are not only limited to foreign companies. I don't know if I made myself clear. We as a private company also desire a fair, transparent, and regulatory environment in which we could compete with foreign companies and state-owned companies instead of special treatment for everyone, which I think is inappropriate. Indeed, a lot of work still needs to be done in these areas, but I also see it, it is being done. I believe it will become better and better. I would say without qualification that we would have looked for a partner anyway. We don't know a lot about doing business in China. We know a lot about products and risk and compliance and insurance. But you've got a glimpse of the insight that Fosun has into the dynamics of the market and behavior. And Fosun is a very high value added partner. They bring specific distribution opportunities to us. They bring expertise in the marketplace in general. They bring important relationships, well respected, for example, by the regulators that we have to deal with. So we would have looked for a partner, I think, no matter what, whether we were required to or not. And I think we would look for the attributes that add value to doing business in China, and they're the attributes that uh, Fosun brings to the relationship. Well, let's get away from question. Oh, uh, thanks. Um, I actually I cover uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, based out of Washington, D.C., and I was uh, interested to hear uh, Vice Chairman Greer talk about uh, establishing trust uh, between these two uh, companies. 
And you know, I'm always hearing about all of these uh, uh, threats coming out of China and this you know dark hotel uh, piece of malware that targets CEO level types of hotels. And uh, you know, China is often portrayed as sort of uh, an enemy or a threat. I'm wondering if, if both of you could elaborate on what you can do to establish trust and uh, how that sort of environment and perception impacts uh, uh, these uh, bilateral relations between companies and between the countries. Thanks. Well, I, I'll start. The cybersecurity is deeper water than I swim in, so <laughs> I, I can't add very much more to specific issues around cybersecurity. With respect to the trust issue, it, it's very much one-to-one, -one, company to company, person to person. And I would go back again to the choice of the partner and making sure that we have everything right up front and that we have the personal chemistry and that we have the trust and respect and that we have, by the way, appreciation for the value that both of us bring to the relationship. So I, the answer to that one with respect to the trust question, which then I guess extends into issues like cybersecurity, in my view, is again having the right partner. I believe hackers are everywhere in the world, but the U.S. has better ones. The abilities of Chinese ones are improving too. I think there are always such people doing this kind of thing, like a virus. The key is the mutual trust between us, the trust between people, the trust and communication between countries. I think this is very important. The most important thing in trust is to know where the bottom line is. It's impossible that there is no conflict of interest between countries or no guards towards each other. It's impossible. The key is that we need to have a bottom line. They know what you would never do. We know the limits. Don't devote all of our efforts in guarding just because we have different interests being hostile instead of constructive. We have different interests, views and competitions, but we can find common interests through communication to solve problems. What we need is mutual understanding, communication, more discussions together, and more people like you to visit China. What you see here is that companies and people in China are not monsters. They are just like you. They are humans who desire a better life, not people who are thinking about starting a world war all day. It's not that era now. We need understanding and communication. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Guo, uh, you graduated from uh, Fudan University in 1989, only 25 years ago, with a degree in philosophy, not a degree in business. And I am wondering uh, what impact the study of philosophy had on the development of your company. I think the biggest influences, I don't know about the U.S., but in China, studying philosophy means you have learned nothing because it doesn't have an expertise. So studying philosophy in China is equal to learning nothing. The silver lining is that it makes me realize the importance of partners. Because I'm not an expert myself, I realized the importance of my partners since I started the business. Fosun has been having an open and cooperative culture all the time. Four partners have been always together since we started the business in 1992. So we value cooperation very much. 
If you must ask me to say something about the influence of studying philosophy on my business thinking, or about the difference it made on my views towards the society and other opinions, the most important thing about studying philosophy is that it gives me faith, which is that I'm against all forms of extremism. I don't believe there is any merit in any extremism. I believe in inclusion, tolerance, and communication. I believe in looking at an issue from other people's positions. I'm only extreme to oppose extremism. I don't oppose any other things. I try to understand them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm curious, when did you realize, or what was the watershed moment for you as you tried to build this company, or you, you had the idea of this company, when you knew that a true change had occurred, where a uh, fully privately held company would be allowed to prosper and would prosper? Was there a moment? Was there a, a, a phone call of resistance you didn't get? From in fact, for my partners and me, we never said how big we wanted to grow from the beginning. Because four of us are from rural areas and our parents don't have comfortable conditions, the first thing we thought about was, of course, to build a great company that is important to society. But the first step was to think about how to make this company survive and how to earn enough money to support ourselves, our employees, and our parents. After having developed step after step, we might have thought more. When we have developed to a certain level in China, we considered whether we would go abroad. So the growth of Fosun was step by step, not like some internet companies that have been very big vision right from the start and wanted to build a company that can do any business in the world from the beginning. Like Alibaba, it has a great vision. We developed step by step. Fosun never stopped broadening its horizon and vision, but it's more about where we can see from here and where we want to be. So we develop step by step. David, I think this will be the last question. Okay, so one for each of you. For you, it's a very basic question, but who's buying life insurance in this country? And how do demographics play into that? Very curious about that. And then you both were talking about corporate responsibility. I'm very interested in the culture of that, since it's a very nascent, very young culture in this country. Uh, what does it mean to you? Uh, I gather that philanthropy is part of what you do. Uh, how important is that to CEOs in this country, chairmen of the board, chairmen of the board in this country generally, uh, the idea of giving back, and, and how do you do it? How do you decide where to give and to what to give? I'll go first. Uh, on the first one, the, the growth and the emergence of the middle class is almost a cliche in a way in China. But it, it is also a national policy to emphasize the growth and expansion of the middle class and affluence. And so that, in a sense, is the target market. We are, we are trying to be part of serving that growing and emerging middle class. More specifically, one of the things we do is worksite marketing, and we sell products to employees of other private sector companies, for example, with whom we have relationships. We also target more upscale clients, and Fosun's reputation helps us in that market. The affiliation with Fosun and the, the, the upscale image of the entrepreneurial China helps us when we sell insurance to the more upscale clients in China. 
So those would be the, the three themes, the emerging middle class, the employee base of other private sector companies, and the wealth sector. And corporate social responsibility. I don't have a very direct view. I think in China, or in the world, that building a good company is the biggest philanthropy. I don't think running a company is not a philanthropic act, and only doing things outside the company is philanthropy. Doing a business well, treating your employees and clients nicely, paying more taxes are the kind of philanthropy that China and developing countries especially need. Taking out your money and distributing it to others is not necessarily a kind of philanthropy. For someone my age, the greatest philanthropy I can do to society is to try my best to run my business better, to employ more talented people, and to pay more taxes. Of course, while you're running a business, your business well, of course while you, of course, while you are running your business well, it would be better if you could do more it would be better if you could do more philanthropy courses so i participated in tnc an environmental organization outside of our business we will also do something to improve china's natural environment second fosun set up a charitable foundation fosun's charitable foundation will invest more in education and culture including Chinese traditional culture and Tai Chi. We will also invest more in children. To help, we will also invest more in children to help with the health and growth of the children from poor families. We are going to do all of this. But I still want to emphasize, until today, the most important thing for China and Fosun is to do business well. This is the kind of philanthropy and social benefit that China needs the most. And then as a segue into our next um, session, how does Tai Chi work into your busy work day and why is it important to you? First of all, practicing Tai Chi energizes you so you can devote more into your work. Second, it maintains a better balance between your body and mind because it not only focuses on the external. Tai Chi also focuses on your inner world. The best thing about Tai Chi is that it doesn't have many requirements about time and place, so it's the most environment friendly. I used to play golf a lot, but you know, golf needs a large amount of land and a lot of time, and it pollutes. Tai Chi requires nothing. You can practice it with such a small space, so it's the most environment friendly one among all the sports. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Vice Chairman.